What is up, fellow renegades across the interwebs? Before we begin the video, as always, I want to give a big shout out to our most recent Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Extinction Team 75, Jacques from Wetterin, Lily Panda, Apprentice, Coma Blitz, Kid Cipher, C Raccoon, Aaron White, Gregory B, Fiat Voltus Mea, Joseph Dungan, Chris Andrews, Sean McLaughlin, Mariner, a me boy, Mage Click, Snowy, Zaxxon six six six, Cursing Throne ninety two, Ali Mocha, Duncan, Dimitri Theodosakis, Lily Panda, H E V Mark Four, Jesse the Educator, Austin Hall, Ethan Davis, Commander Nom Nom, Corbin, Ethan Kuyoth, and as always, I want to give a shout out to our executive producer, Bevan Brummett. Thank you all very much for your support. If you want to become a Patreon supporter, feel free to click the link in the description to find out more. We'll see you there. Good job! See what happens? No! See what happens when you're stupid? See what happens? Ah! No! National security! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! No! Let me out of the box! Daddy, please let me out of the box! I'm stuck! Look at me! Look at me! Look at me! I'm stuck up here! I'm stuck up here! Look! So until we are able to, uh, confirm whether or not you've seen Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, I guess we're going to just, uh, go around and react to, uh, other kill counts. And hey, looky here, if it isn't one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. Same. <laughs> Tremors. Jesus. It's probably the first horror movie I was actually a big fan of. Because it's not that horrific, you know. It's more... It's, well, it's, it's like an action it, horror. Again, it's it it's reminiscent. It's a callback to a lot of the creature features of the fi of like the 50s and 60s. Uh, and it's a pretty horrifying concept with some, like... like some of the circumstances that the uh, characters find themselves in are very, like... Like, kind of... Or, kind of die, like very messed up yeah uh there's one kill in this that actually scared me really bad and like made me uh, uh sort of like made me claustrophobic in cars uh and i'll tell you the one that it is but um or whenever he shows it on here because i know he is um but overall for me it was yeah. like you know it's it's it was a bright film that took place mostly during the daytime mm -hmm. so that yeah. helped um, and then <clears throat> it was like, okay, they can stand on rocks to basically be safe from them because mm -hmm. they can only come up through the dirt. Yes. And so it wasn't like the most terrifying movie I'd ever seen. And like the effects, like, you know, nobody got like horribly gored or anything that I remember. Uh, there were a few that were pretty, that were pretty bloody. I mean, uh, the shopkeeper, um, uh, uh, I really can't remember that much, to be his, honest. His, I think, was probably one of the more disturbing... I, plus, I think I only ever saw it on TV, so it very well could have been censored for TV as well. That's the other thing, too. I uh, f First place I ever saw it was on kid or on uh, TV when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there was a lot of swearing that was censored and all that, especially uh, from Bert. Yeah. Uh, again, Bert Gummer, one of my favorite characters in all of, like... Uh, like horror movies ever he is the dude not only who's prepared he's over prepared <laughs> and then he's over prepared Broke into the wrong rec room didn't you you bastard yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> and also the fact that they had reba mcintyre in this as well that was another thing that shocked me i was just like reba because yeah. my grandmother on my on my mom's side was a big fan of reba mcintyre and i knew all about reba mcintyre and um, I'm just, like, I was amazed by that. And then also uh, just the, all the stuff that's in this. And Kevin Bacon as well. I mean, Kevin Bacon was, uh, yeah, a lot of fun in this. And also Fred Ward, who plays uh, uh, Earl in this. He was in another movie in the 80s that my dad really liked. Uh, it, was, uh, it was called Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins. And it's, it's one of those, like, classic... Uh, classic like spy movies. Uh, it and it's about a guy who basically has facial reconstruction and becomes a uh, an agent working for this company. He's legally dead, and he's been given a new identity and everything. And it's it's a lot of fun. And it actually has one of the funniest characters ever. His uh, instructor, who's this old Korean dude, who uh, 
never gets hurt. He's impervious. He's basically impervious to getting hurt. And they get, like, they jump out of a vehicle, and uh, he's supposed to jump out with them, but his door handle breaks, and he gets stuck in the car as it rolls down the hill. There's this huge crash. It doesn't explode or anything, but the car just, like, does, like, about 30 rolls, and it just, like, lands down at the bottom of the hill. He finds the old man inside, still holding onto the door handle, perfectly intact, and he just looks up at Remo and says, In Korea, when you put, when you pull door handle, door opens. <laughs> and that was such a great movie. Anyway, we got Tremors here. This is, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. Here we go. Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims oh, of all our you're favorite not James. movies. That is I'm not, James. not James A. Janice. I'm actually Zoran Argovoyich. Oh, well, he's one of the writers that works with James. Okay. James and Chelsea tend to their wedding and overall health. I'll be covering the Tremors oh. franchise, starting okay. with the original Tremors released in 1990. Tremors is one of my all-time favorite films, as evidenced by my Illinois license plate, my screen uh. shrieker skull, and the full-size graboid I added to my Chicago sketch group Long Pork back in 2009. <laughs> you were goddamn sketch show, didn't you, you bastard? Thanks to your supportive comments and love slash tolerance for they talk, I'll be taking you through all seven films in this little franchise they could, starting with the only film in the franchise released theatrically. Not many people know that the the first Tremors was a box office bomb. No, it was. Disaster. The head of Universal did call me and said, well, we just blew it. But thanks to these new things called VHSs that most of you have never seen, Tremors started nope. being I had a whole collection of rented. VHSs. Huh? I had a whole collection of VHSs. I still got mine in there, dude. A whole bunch of them. And re-rented and re-rented and re-rented. And it was a hit. And gave birth to six sequels, a TV show on sci-fi, another failed pilot for sci-fi, and a graboid-shaped cocksock. Whoever can fill this up, I gotta tell you, that's pretty impressive. The original <laughs> Tremors was written by Brent Maddock and Steve S.S. Wilson, uh, the creators of the Short Circuit films. The idea for the film originated when Steve was on a desert hike, and it was originally called Land Sharks. But since SNL had a popular Land Shark character, Land Shark, they changed the title to Beneath Perfection, a name that still wouldn't stick when Universal Chairman Tom Pollock. Jesus Christ! <laughs> it's a wall-eyed motherfucker. <laughs> It's like, why are your eyes like that? So I can see danger coming from every direction. Forced them to call it Tremors in hopes that the relation to earthquakes would make the movie sell better in Japan due to a series of recent earthquakes. Under the skillful direction of Ron Underwood, best known for City Slickers and hopefully forgotten for Pluto Nash, Tremors is a film uh, that defies classification. Is it horror? Is it comedy? Sci-fi? Romance? Yes. The answer to all of them is yes. Taking heavy inspiration from the B-monster movies of the 50s, there's laughter one minute, genuine scares the next, and some of the greatest practical effects ever put on screen, courtesy of Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. of Amalgamated Dynamics in their first feature. The production was a grueling one, with 110 degree days, rattlesnakes, malfunctioning worms, and even snow. Everybody was just freezing. It was just grisly. But the crew pulled together snow and that environment. True. <laughs> hey man, that's the desert for you. I mean, it gets blazing hot during the daytime, and then whenever dusk hits, so when the snow comes sometimes. Ooh. Labor of love. Tremors is the story of Perfection Nevada, an isolated desert town with a small population of ordinary people. Our heroes are a couple of good old boys named Val and Earl. They get fed up with all the shit work in this small town and head off to the big city for a better life. Unfortunately, some giant underground monsters have other plans for them. We decided to leave this place just one damn day too late, you know? The creatures known as Graboids attack the town intent on eating its residents, and it's up to everyone to band together and come up with a plan to survive. And man, do they come up with a lot of plans. Luckily, there are plenty of kills in between the planning to keep you little meaties interested. Will the best laid plans of these nice men end in a Graboid buffet? Let's find out and get to the kills. Here we go. The movie begins with an alias style title card. Leading to a man peeing all over a map painting. The man draining his bacon is none other than Kevin Bacon, playing our hero, Valentine McKee. Bacon was previously seen on my breakfast plate this morning and on the kill count getting subvenied in Friday the 13th. Kevin was at a low point in his career when he took this job. I was, um, running out of money. And originally hated being part of the film since it was a box office bomb. I can't believe I'm doing it. Fucking movie about underground worms. But since then has come around. He's the only character that I really that I've ever played that I really wanted to go back and, and 
revisit. He even did so in an unaired pilot for Sci-Fi Channel in 2018. But sadly, it wasn't picked up. I guess it wasn't good enough to join the likes of Alien News Desk, Deadly Class, Ghost Wars, Krypton, Night Flyers, and Superstition. Yeah, we get it. Sci-Fi yeah. is fucking awful. Yeah. Dear God, is it fucking awful. I still watched it a lot when I was younger, but it was bad. I only watched it whenever they were showing anime. I watched it, like, for a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm, I think they had X-Files on there at a point. That's true. They had that, too. I forgot um, about that. And then they had some other shows that were actually entertaining, if not great, you know. And they had some movies that were entertaining, if yes, not great. Yes, I will admit like, that. There were some movies that I saw that were, like, advertised on there, and I'm like, hmm, I'm going to give that a shot. And they were okay. Not bad. Superstition just sounds kind of like a ripoff of Supernatural to me. <laughs> And it should be cool because it had Mario Van Peebles in it, but oh well. But it was on sci-fi, so. <laughs> uh, also, like, it's just, uh, I watched up to a point, and, like, they were, like, already kind of, like, not the highest tier TV. It was just, like, the only channel that was just mostly sci-fi stuff that you could well, watch. Well, sci-fi, so. horror, and, um, it, they were but really But at, at a point, like, they went from, like, you know, like, doing like low up and downs on like the line of like what's good and bad to just mm -hmm. down and just into the ground like awful stuff all I the mean, time you had a Kevin Bacon led tr Tremors reboot what's not what's not to love man come on you had gold there sci-fi and you fucked it up you know, all those classics. Val gently nudges his buddy Earl away. Earl, played by prolific character actor Fred Ward, wakes up with a squint <laughs> and we get to meet our heroes. Two non-canine good old boys who love to swear and smoke. In order to decide who makes breakfast, they resort to rock, paper, scissors. That will be a running gag throughout this movie. Val and Earl are hired hands. Handymen, Earl. Sorry, handymen who use their handy hands to eventually... You fucking suck. Put up a fence before heading <laughs> off on this. Jesus Christ. I wonder if they kept that in because, you know, like. Yeah, that was... he was probably meant to get it a lot quicker than that. And he just kept missing, so they just left it because it was kind of funny. Yeah, it just shows you how effective they are at being handy, man. Yeah. Very special day. This is garbage day. Garbage day! <laughs> God dang it, of course. Already? Their romantic bickering establishes their friendship and lets us know that Val isn't the most responsible fella. Damn it, Valentine, you never plan ahead. Yeah, if you did, maybe you would have said no to R.I.P.D. Earl's scolding is interrupted when Val spots the new grad student and proceeds to inform us what he truly values in a woman. Long blonde hair, big green eyes, world-class breasts. And ask the one quick and legs that go all the way up. This narrow list of criteria is... That stuck in my head when I first heard that. <laughs> I just I like, that's ex that stuck in your it's head. extremely sexist, but it's just the way he delivered well, again, it. Like, stuck it's just, in my head. Again, it's building this dream woman in his head. Like me, I, when I was a kid, I had a I had a type, but then eventually I grew up and I was just like, eh, woman is a woman. Isn't fulfilled by Rhonda LeBeck, a grad student and Gilligan's Island cosplayer studying seismology. <laughs> She's played by Finn Carter, who deserves an Oscar for pretending this was a warm and sunny day when it was actually snowing. Finn is having a terrible time staying warm between takes. Rhonda's been getting some strange readings on the seismographs, but Val and Earl don't know nothing about no foreshadowing, so they wish her luck and head back to town. Well, Rhonda realizes she shouldn't have done her last batch of cocaine Scarface style. We finally arrive at Perfection, Nevada, population 14. But they better get out some paint because that number is about to go down. This town was built by production designer Evo Cristante and his team by purchasing cheap shacks from the side of the road, dismantling them and remantling them in Lone Pine, California, a great filming location used in both classic westerns and space westerns alike. Al and Earl pass by hey, this old bag Melvin bouncing his balls on people's cars, but, you know, hey, what do you expect from someone named after a wedgie? Inside Chang's Market, we meet Bert and Heather, two other perfection residents buying some ketchup, cookies, and a uh, hollow point bullet. Like, hey, what's wrong with that? I like hollow points. <laughs> Heather is played by country singer Reba McIntyre in her feature film debut, and her husband is played by Michael Gross, best known as Stephen Keaton on Family Ties. Michael has gone on to be the only actor to appear in every Tremors film and the TV show. And we learned that Bert is a bit of a paranoid gun nut. Sing the feds will be at our door. Sorry, time to move. 
Eminent domain. And I'm sure that won't come into play later. Let's just take a moment to introduce the rest of the town now. Starting with the general store's owner, Walter Chang. He's played by Victor Wong, another amazing uh. character actor known for Big Trouble in Little China and the Three Ninjas films that only 90s kids remember. There's also Miguel, uh. a lovable cattle rancher, Nestor, a local drunk and not Melvin's dad, as many believe, and finally there's Nancy, a hippie pottery artist, and her pogo-bouncing daughter, Mindy, played by Ariana Richards. Best known for wiggling jello and hacking into the world's dumbest computer. <laughs> computer system in Jurassic Park. But enough yeah. of these humans, where are the damn monsters? Well, they're a bit shy, only appearing as shaky dirt and seismo lines that Rhonda jots down in a journal she borrowed from Ashton Kutcher. After the cameraman wakes up, he follows Rhonda along with a gravoid in this effect they achieve by dragging a boat buoy in a dirt trench under a layer of latex rubber. It was the most reliable oh. effect in the movie with only one problem. We would forget where it was. I guess you should <laughs> <have a> comment. <laughs> It's like, it's like, where'd you leave it? I don't fucking know. Where'd you leave? Well, they forget where the uh, latex is at. I'm sure some people nearly fucking broke their legs at points because they fucking stepped on it. Like I was, I was like, hey, let's check over. <laughs> Found it. God damn it. Found it. With Rhonda, who does not know where the graboid is, as she obliviously escapes. Back in perfection, Val and Earl have graduated from garbage to sewage as they argue about being trapped in town due to Val's poor planning skills. Val, They're interrupted when they shit. strike oil, or shit, you know, Black Bowl, Texas teepee, yeah! That's enough that to kickstart their exodus from perfection. That's... Val grabs his porn in a vacuum, let's hope those two things aren't related, and they head off to Bixby. Bixby! <laughs> <laughs> That's a town that they refer to often in this series, but is only ever seen in an episode of the TV show featuring a giant prehistoric shrimp. I'm not kidding. The Bixby Bound boys bypass a man hanging off an electrical tower and Val uses his supervision to identify it as Edgar Deems, a local farmer and mule lover who originally appeared in a deleted opening scene. One quick rock, paper, scissors later and Val climbs up to find Edgar Deems dead and looking like Gramps from House 2, the second story. They take the body Damn. to Jim, the local doctor, and learn that Edgar died of dehydration. Oh, oh, oh boy, that is a big word for Val. Can you can you dumb it down a bit? First. Another perfection resident who lives further out from town is old Fred, currently gardening with his scare wife, High Plate Patty. Suddenly, his sheep go all crazy Ralph on him, warning of impending doom. Even Patty tries to warn him, but she also might be drunk. In any event, he's attacked and pulled into the ground by a graboid. Val and Earl arrive to find a bunch of dead sheep. Let's see, there's one dead sheep, two dead sheep, three dead sheep. Yeah. Oh, God. Ugh. Thank God we only count humanoids on this thing, am I right? <laughs> anyway, they look for Fred, and they only find his Fredora. And when they pick it up, we see drop-dead Fred's severed head. Yes, the grab boy's eyes were yeah. bigger than their stomachs. <laughs> that, one, that one got me a little bit when I was younger. I was like, huh. See, I don't think that I realized that... Um, I mean, I saw this when I was young, so I don't think I put two and two together that his head was no longer attached to his body. I thought it would just, like, you know, he looked like he was just kind of buried under the sand at that point. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Wait, they're blind, aren't they? Damn it! The boys head back to town and warn a couple of road workers along the way. A murderer, man, a real psycho! He's, he's, he's cutting people's heads off! But these Mario brothers don't buy it and continue digging their way to the Mushroom Kingdom. <laughs> Oh, Yoshi! Oh, wait, it's a Graboid. The Graboid embedded jackhammer hightails it out oh, I saw that was cool. I did, yeah, I is love that. off screen and killed while his Mario brother Howard attempts to help by getting in the way of a rock slide. We later see that his construction hat is filled with brain jello, solidifying that he did not have an extra life. <laughs> Still thinking there's a serial killer lopping off people's heads, Val and Earl try and leave but get hung up on the side of the road. They finally free themselves and get back to town to find everyone on the call sheet. And the reveal of a our monster! Behold! The Graboid in all its glory! At least that's what the writers wanted you to think. The Snake Boy tentacles yep. helped keep the budget low and served as a fun misdirect for the audience. They were brought to life using a combination of cable puppets and old school hand puppets like a slimy Muppet from Hell. Away from town, the Doc and his wife have been working so hard on their new house, he starts to hallucinate psychic visions. I'm dead. And right on cue, the generator goes out, prompting him to put those Dead by Daylight skills to the test. Of course, you can't play the minigame without a generator. Wonder where it could have gone. 
Ho ho! Jump scare! Take that, Magool. The doc stumbles into a sneaky ground mouth and is sucked under, being eaten alive while his wife tries to save him with a 2x4. But Balsa's no substitute for a good oak. Doc Jim is sucked into the ground and eaten alive. His wife tries to verify the kill for us, but instead is attacked and chased into the car. She Fonzies a radio on as the Graboids attack and begin to suck her under the ground. Now, originally she was supposed to climb on the front of the car and go down with it like the Titanic, but an issue on the day caused them to replace it with this post-production shot of the headlights going out alongside the light of Megan's life. Yeah, that one got me a little bit, because, uh, you know, I, it made me a little claustrophobic, like, like just a car being buried car alive. being sucked into the ground. Yeah, that, I was yeah. just like, because as a kid, you know, kids think of a bunch of dumb shit. For instance, a lot of kids think, oh, I'm going to be sucked down the drain. Honestly, I thought the husband's death was scarier as a kid because how she tried to do the board. That, yeah, that too. And then the board breaks and stuff. Yeah. I was just like, oh, man, no. Like, you know, oh, it's just yeah. like, it's like, oh, he might that be one. able to pull himself out. Like, and he just, as a kid, also my brain wasn't piecing together like these little snake things just biting chunks off of him under the ground as, you know, my, my adult brain pictures that. I've seen more horror movies and horror games and I just picture like how fucked up you're probably getting as you get pulled under. Well, it's you're a lot scarier, to be honest. Thing, you're getting mangled. By yeah, you're literally getting traveling. eaten alive as you get pulled underground. It's pretty pretty scary, yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, the practical effects in this are just so good, too. Like, honestly, like, that's an off-screen death, but I love the fact that they did the headlight thing. That, I think yeah. that makes it a really cool on-screen death, kind of like the lightning flash Jason stab. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's a cool idea. Like, they did more than just have someone scream off-screen. Like... So I thought it was neat. Like. Back in perfection, we get the first of many planning scenes. Hurt kicks into survival mode. We arm ourselves, we set perimeters, we stand guard. And Heather lays it out plainly for us. Phone's out, the road's out. We're on our own. Surrounded by mountains with no way out, it's up to Val and Earl to go for help by taking Chang's horses to Bixby. Bixby! <laughs> While prepping the horses, Walter gives them my favorite combination of supplies ever. Here's some Swiss cheese and some bullets. Oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Bert and Heather set out to find the college girl Rhonda, and Melvin and the snake monster bid them a fond farewell as they ride off into the sunrise. Out here in Nevada, life is far oh, from God. perfection. Yeah, the, the sun is hat. hot, jobs are shit, and the wildlife. Bites. Make sure you're prepared for whatever life throws at you with Swiss cheese and bullets. <laughs> That's right. The holiest of cheeses pairs perfectly with making the holiest of holiest. Swiss cheese and bullets. It's a thing. <laughs> Available at Chang's Market while shop owners lays. Val and Earl arrive at the Doc's Metal Lab last. new home with no trace of them, except for the sound of a radio coming from under the ground. They discover the buried front end of the family truckster with its lights still on. The boys book it to Bixby right past that shitty fence they were making earlier, only to have their horses spooked and subsequently snatched by a Graboid tentacle, as well as some fishing line. Val gets demoted from Major Dummy to Captain Obvious. They're under the goddamn ground. Not for long, they aren't. <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> it's such a great design. The Graboid was designed by Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr., two prolific practical effects artists who worked on countless films, including Alien 3, the original Mortal Kombat, and It. This was the first film for their newly formed company, Amalgamated Dynamics. After having originally worked for the legendary... The man! They based the Stan fucking Winston. Yes. Would design off real animals like slugs, rhinos, uh. and snapping turtles. And in the original design, the Graboids would cover their heads with a protective fleshy casing. But someone at the studio saw the design and said, This is not going to be a movie about giant dicks chasing people through the desert. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, hell, I, I guess they had to circumcise them. Yeah. It's probably a good call. Oh, wow, I didn't know the Graboids were Jewish. Sorry. Though an uncircumcised Graboid would be able to experience 20% more sensation while killing. The first shot is actually a miniature done by <laughs> the Scotech Brothers Zord. of Forward Productions. Using quarter-scale Graboids that seamlessly blend with the full-size ones created by Amalgamated Dynamics. Val and Earl take off the Graboid in hot pursuit. Damn it, Graboid! You know how long it took him to nail in that post? I certainly... And better with a hammer than I was in the movie. The Graboid continues to critique their handiwork as they approach a canal and initiate a jump program. But Yeet. unable to free their minds, they come up short as they scramble to escape the oncoming worm, which collides into the concrete, knocking itself cold. Cold my ass. 
That some bitch is dead. He's dead. And as a special treat, I'm also <laughs> going to be tracking the Graboid deaths in Bert's hunting log. So we can see who came out ahead by the end of this franchise. How do you feel about that, Val? Fuck you! Well, <laughs> the one F word that they use, that they got... Yeah, so see, I didn't see that when I first saw the movie. No, I mean either. I didn't get to see that till I was renting horror movies again later, like in high school from uh, the store. And I was like, oh yeah, I don't remember him screaming that on TV. Like, well, there was another one later on. Uh, uh, back when the film, like they didn't know if they wanted to have it rated R or a PG-13. They didn't get a chance to reshoot it. But uh, it's uh, whenever they're on the radio, uh, it's like, we got him. We got that mother humper. It's like, well, just know, Bert, there are two more. Repeat, two more mother humpers. And you can clearly see that they're mouthing motherfucker. Oh, but they had to censor it. They had so to it censor it in, post, in post-production yeah. because you're allowed one F-bomb in a PG-13 film. This is it. And that was it right there. And I think rightfully so. That's a pretty, like, effective fuck you to the to the damn Graboid. Yeah. Well, fuck you two. But unlike me, you can only use one F bomb per PG 13 movie. A fact Jesus Christ, Sword, are you gonna <laughs> ape all my shit? <laughs> Filmmakers weren't aware of that led to some very interesting dubs we'll hear later. Rhonda appears out of nowhere. Again? <laughs> and then they exhume the body. She notices that they have no eyes, and Earl hypothesizes that the snakeoid tentacles are used to reel you into the mouth. What do you have to add, Val? I found the ass in! Oh, Val, you're lucky you're so pretty. Rhonda, a.k.a. the Doc Brown of the desert, exposits that the creatures move <laughs> through the dirt with these spikes. Moving so fast, it creates seismic tremors and great Scott! Rhonda realizes there are three more graboids out there due to these separate seismic readings. What? Jesus Christ, Val, pay attention. You know what, just what? go around this truck. But as they do, a graboid appears, forcing them up onto a nearby rock. Based on the torn tentacle, they recognize this is the one that graboided their truck earlier, oh, yeah. dubbing him Stumpy. Stumpy. Val checks to see Damn if it. the graboid's headed off, but this blind baddie is sticking around for some reason. It senses seismic vibration. It can hear every move we make, especially on this rock. It's a perfect conductor. Well, fuck. Day turns to night, and then right back to day, as Val and Rhonda snuggle up to their romantic subplot. They check to see if old Stumpy is still out there, but since Stump's mother-in-law is in town, he's in no rush to head back home. Another planning scene occurs. Why don't we just make a run for it? We outran him yesterday. Run for it? What is not a plan? The runner knows what to do with a plan fails. But Rhonda's ten steps ahead. She grabs some Deus Ex sticky nuts and proceeds to the trademark of the Tremors franchise. Doing what Hold you on. can with what you got. We just stay where it can't get us. These residual boulders. Wilson and Maddox wanted to subvert the horror tropes of idiot people doing dumbass things in horror movies. Yes. He instead wanted to have actual smart protagonists for once. What? <laughs> okay, not all smart protagonists. But, but, at least problem solving yeah like at least logical problem solving because that is something that is grossly missing in horror films and that's one thing well, and see that's that one I'm of the things that i've always said too is i was like it makes a scarier movie when you see people making smarter decisions but still well, not coming out on well, top because that means that the evil force whatever is coming after you the monster the ghost whatever yeah the it's like it doesn't care if you're smart well, it's gonna get you anyway well or the killer is learning and is getting better yeah. at hunting you that's again that's what can make a good dynamic between a protagonist and a villain is if the villain also learns and grows with the main character. Jesus yeah. Christ, people, it's not that hard. People have been playing with that recently, like uh, with, um, for example, uh, Your Next. Yes. And uh, like because it's, uh, Don't Breathe was another one. There's a lot of characters did. that made dumb decisions in Your Next. Oh but yes. At least you know. Oh, but there. And, were... and then uh, what's the one? The one with the deaf girl. Um, oh, uh, that that one was uh... where the dude tries to break into her house, like, but uh, she ends up fighting him off. Like, she made pretty smart decisions throughout that movie. I, f I forget, I forget which one. Um, but Don't Breathe was another one that also, uh, you know, I still haven't seen that one. But well, okay, that's what we need to watch. Yeah. You'll, I, you will enjoy the fuck out of that. But yeah, like it's just like they're playing with it by doing one character being smart. And, like, I think they should just try to write movies where they don't have people make completely dumb decisions to get them killed. Yes. Like, you don't have to increase the body count. Yeah, like, make the force strong enough that even if they make smart decisions, they still get screwed over sometimes. Yes. Jesus. 
What? Oh, Jesus. Okay, smart enough. We get a nice synchronized pole vault montage, and these boulders were actually made for the scene by Ivo Cristante, and led to some sound issues because they were completely hollow inside. The montage is set to a fun, bluesy western score by composer Ernest Troost. <laughs> Originally having scored the whole film, half of Ernest's music was replaced in post by Robert Bolt, who was brought in to add punch to the more action-heavy scenes. It's sad that his full score was truncated, but I actually think the two mesh beautifully. They make it to the truck, fighting off Stumpy, as Rhonda does the greatest display of blind driving since Al Pacino. They regroup with the others in perfection, uh, when guys, Nancy a little help. someone is bound to check on them since the roads are out. You're absolutely right, Nancy. Unfortunately, the Nev Caltel workers sent to check on them result in two more kills, represented by more brain jello helmets and a belt for some reason. You know, maybe you took them off after a nice Thanksgiving dinner or something. Pants are so constricting. I mean, I'm not worried. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a Zorin. <laughs> Damn it. So, uh, actually, the tool belt, I could definitely see it, like, getting caught on the ground if the get dude's getting dragged underneath. Because a tool belt is, like, usually hanging loose on you. Like, whenever my dad had his on, it was always loose. It was always, like, tilted up a little bit. But, yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, it could even no, give no, you a no, cool no, situation to imagine in your mind. Like oh, that, hey, James! Where he's pulled under the ground and grabs hold of his tool belt, you know? Yeah. And then it's just like, you know, it was whoosh, like, whoosh, like yeah. it's pulled off of it. Just and it's the tool belt's left. They're not optional, even if they're out of frame. All right, you put these on right now, or else this whole little experiment ends. <laughs> Sorry, Chang. Well, it's his channel. Back at the market, Chang and Melvin <laughs> brainstorm names for the creature. Snakeoids! Hal points out that this valley is one long smorgasbord, and they're the main course. And what name is that reservation under? Boy. Thanks, Chang. Even though most people, like my mom, just call them tremors. Some dumbass plans are thrown out. I'll just hit him with a five-pound pickaxe. And then Rhonda suggests they head into the mountains up an old jeep trail. Seems like a good plan as long as the Graboids take their time. <laughs> Never mind. Guess they have a taste for hereditary head. Looks like the Graboids have arrived for dinner. Party of three. And it cool, that is. They pick some floorboards and Rhonda reminds the audience how to outwit them. Oh man, not even good vibrations like the ones Mindy is listening to on her pogo stick? Guess not as the Graboid heads towards Mindy and unfortunately, this ain't no Veggie-saurus. Val runs and tackles her stunt double off the pogo stick that defies all laws of gravity as it's sucked under the ground. Everyone separates while Rhonda and Earl spot a second Graboid. Earl heads into chains, but Rhonda gets caught in some barbed wire and is in need of saving as the Graboid reels in its catch. Luckily, she doesn't have to hold out for a hero for long, cause here comes Val with a pickaxe. Boom! That's not Gonna, it worked! Are you kidding me? Nestor, you genius! While the grab was distracted, uh, Val becomes as eloquent as an 18-year-old on prom night. Get out of your pants! Okay! <laughs> no! Zorin? No. Thank you, James. <laughs> well, it works for Val, and Rhonda is free just as another Graboid joins the No Pants Party. They run back to Chang's in one of the most iconic shots as the Graboid displaces the floorboards <laughs> behind them. That is a cool looking shot. While he tends to her corn syrup wounds, and Earl creepily approves of their relationship. Before things can get too happy, though, a noisy freezer brings a Graboid to shop at Chang's store. And it ain't looking for no Swiss cheese and bullets. The Graboid bites into Walter Chang, giving him an oddly instantaneous nosebleed. He's yanked around Jaw style and pulled down to his yeah. death. That's what you get for calling them names it's because again i watched the the three ninjas movies when i was a kid and i always knew him as like the grandpa he was always like the grandpa character and yeah, i never did see those myself and for him to get killed like that i was like no grandpa yeah oh a second Graboid joins the party as the humans all play The Floor is Lava. The one vegetarian tentacle samples the local cuisine while everyone heads to the roof. Rhonda gets knocked out a window, which separates her from the others, finding safety at the nearby water tower. Heather and Bert show off their vanity plates and CB over to the <laughs> store to find out why everyone's up on their roofs. Well, might as well run this shell case polisher while you wait for an answer. Of course, this loud-ass machine attracts a Graboid that bursts through their basement bunker. But don't worry, they're able to fend it off with a wall of fire! 
fucking gun. Yes. Shotguns, automatic <laughs> rifles, green screen stunt doubles. They use it all in this F-A-L. sequence that was filmed with an amazing blend of small scale puppets and full size graboids. The effect blends seamlessly as showcased by this shot where Bert drops a gun on a full stage and it whip pans over to a small scale puppet filmed separately. Heather goes all John Woo minus the dubs, but can't take this graboid's face off. So it's time to literally pull out the big guns. Bert grabs an eight gauge darn shotgun, AKA the elephant gun, and unloads two massive shots that end the graboid and give us the best line ever. Broke into the wrong goddamn rec room, didn't you, you bastard? <laughs> Love that one so yeah. much. Some of the best lines ever. Also, not only that, but the the elephant, that's a 700 Nitro Express double barrel. <laughs> that is a beast of a fucking gauge right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> Whew. That thing, honestly, when I, I remember seeing this scene when I was a kid, and just like as soon as he breaks out, I'm like, what, what, what's that? Sm-? The big and then he pulled out the, and then you, and it was so good because on the row behind where he pulls the shells out, you see the smaller caliber bullets behind it, and then he puts the box of elephant gun shells down, and they're literally like that big around yeah. next to the regular bullets. And as a kid, I was like, Oh, it's like even if you don't know about guns, they did a good job of like explaining this is the big gun. Visual storytelling. Yeah. You don't actually have to. He he didn't have to. Like she didn't have to yell. Like get the elephant gun yeah. or anything like that. Instead, just oh, guns. so good. Bert grabs man. an eight gauge darn shotgun, aka yeah, again and just Michael Gross and his delivery, perfect. Just yep. chef's kiss. That's why he's the best character. Also, I think Zorin, like, blitzed that, it, over... My two favorite quotes in the whole series are from him. And it's that one and then and the second one, I believe. I think it's the second one and not this one. But in the second one, after, like, the little hoppers show up, like, yeah. and he pulls up and he's like, I am completely out of ammo. Oh, That's yeah. never happened to me before. He's just... <laughs> he's, he, yeah, uh, I remember that. He gets out of his truck. He's just like, I was surrounded by them. I threw my... I threw my vehicle into six-wheel mode and ran most of them down. And I am completely out of ammo. That's never happened to me before. (laughs) Just, again, Michael Gross made, like, made the... the, uh, Again, makes the films so much better just by him being in them. The third one's okay. I'll say this. The first one's good. The second one's okay. The third one's okay, and then after that, I stopped paying attention. Yeah. The elephant gun and unloads two massive shots that end the graboid and give us the best line ever. Broke into the wrong goddamn rec room, didn't you, you bastard? Because why not? <laughs> One more time. To the hunting log. Bird announces his triumph over the radio, and Val responds with a dub F bomb. Be advised, however, there are two more. Repeat, two more mother humpers. Earl tells them to yeah. head to Bixby. <laughs> see what I mean? Yeah, you can see them, same motherfuckers. Exactly, and again, really wish we had an R-rated cut of this so that they would sub all that back in yeah. like a director's cut unrated I'd like that but uh, the standards back then you had to destroy the footage that you didn't use in the final cut so stupid it is and that's why films like before everything went digital uh, that's why a lot of those films will never have their, no, like, uh, their stuff restored and stuff yeah. yeah the only ones who did were George Lucas uh, you know, he kept a lot of the footage for uh, for the uh, Star Wars films that you know went uh, that uh, went unused, and he later used it to restore it in like his special editions. Which I don't know whose stupid idea that was. Like, um, you have to destroy it, whatever film. You it was need. typically it was typically uh, the studios that demanded it because of uh, be- I think because of legal potential legal issues. I'm not sure. It's just like, uh, did you know that back in the day, whenever you were transporting film reels, you were not allowed to ride on a trolley car or a train or an airplane? No. Do you know why? Because the nitrate film that was used uh, for regular everyday films back in the day was four times more flammable than paper. Oh. So, yeah, it was basically a walking bomb if anyone had a had an open flame around it. Mm. It was, yeah. It's actually kind of, kind of scary, but hey, it is what it is. Me. Me. Dad, Dad, it. Old pal Stumpy has his own plan. What do you think 
trying to do now? Why do you keep asking me? Oh, come on. Will you just help Miranda? Help, help Miranda. Because Nestor's trailer is in trouble when they flip the bitch, causing Nestor to fall and scramble up onto a tire. But sadly, that idea falls flat, as Nestor is sucked Bye, into the Nestor. ground in a shot that brilliantly uses a shrub to cover the edit point from handheld camera to crane. And even more brilliantly, stump James in the Dead Meat podcast. <laughs> So that person's falling, right? No. No? <laughs> Is it Tremors? It's Tremors. Of course it's fucking Tremors. Zorin! Realizing that they won't survive long enough to wait for help since the Graboids are tearing the building out from under them, which was an effect built by Evo Cristante, who used six giant truck springs inside Chang's market attached to independent sections of the roof. Then, when hundreds of pounds of sand were dumped through a trap door, the whole roof caves in to a fixed point. And then be able to reset for another take. God, brilliant. But enough about that. It's plamorin' time! Yeah, I mean, Perhaps like, literally, the like, the more I see this, the more I'm just like, okay. I think this film is underrated just because it probably has i would say i can't think of anything else like it has the second best practical effects next to john carpenter's the thing i think fair yeah well i mean john carpenter's the thing it was an r-rated film guaranteed from the beginning yeah but i mean just they, in terms of like how well they use practical effects i think this film is like a shining example for like oh, yeah. doing them right in every way oh yeah it, well practicality is always going to be something that if i like as a if i'm going to get more serious into filmmaking i i will want to stand my ground on like certain things being practical uh, as we move forward with I'm our already films. a little disappointed that we picked something that there was no way in hell to actually do p with a practical effect Oh, shit. Damn it. <laughs> uh, we have something in our movie coming up that it was just not feasible to have done without using some CGs. So. Unfortunately, yeah, but the next one that Aldo's actually planning out is something I think we can pull off with practical effects. Especially with lighting. I think it can be done very, very easily. For those of you wondering, Nick is going upstairs to feed Vega, because Vega is a hungry, hungry kitty. <sighs> Love that cat, but you, you can often understand, you, you'll hear him at the top of the stairs whenever Nick comes up, he'll be like, meow, 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 meow. It, he knows, once that bell goes off, he knows, like, it's time. And he can hear it from all the way up in the room, and I can often hear him, like, if he's up on Nick's bed, I can hear him hop down and, like, gallop down the hallway because he knows that Nick is going to be going to the laundry room to get his uh, snack. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but thankfully, it doesn't take that long to... Uh... <clears throat> Uh-oh. Okay. Hmm. It's all right, dude. It happens. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, that's that's right. Nick actually, uh, his uh, glasses lens popped out of his uh, right eye. Well, my frames broke. Yeah. And I'm waiting on him to call me with a replacement. So this one's not. It's just barely in here right now because the frame is technically broke right here. So. I was just sitting there and it just fucking popped for some reason. Defective and uh, frame. He was outside, and when he was outside, he leaned over and then just popped right out and mm -hmm. he didn't see where it went because it was dark out and basically he called me out there to uh go searching for with him we looked for i think it was like what about three four minutes for it and i found it was like hidden under a leaf yeah <clears throat> but thankfully hey we found it and uh he's able to see again 
And I also I gave him a litmus test. I was like, hey, how many fingers am I holding up? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Lantern time! Bert and Heather can take their cheat. <laughs> okay, uh, do you have a tank they could use? The cat! Wait, do you mean Lucy? Weighs better than 30 tons. There's no way they could lift 30 tons. Okay, I mean, she's put on a little holiday weight, but she's not that obese. <laughs> we can't all fit on the bulldozer. Oh, cat is a brand of bulldozer. <laughs> Thanks, Miguel. Now, yeah. no more lines till part three. The new it's planet is... caterpillar. Huh? Technically, caterpillar. They just call it cat for short. Yeah. Also, Miguel wasn't in the second one. Uh, he was in the third one, though. Yeah, I remember that. To tow a trailer behind the bulldozer, but it's a long ways away. They cleverly use a tractor as a distraction, and Rock Paper Scissors returns like it sponsored this movie to decide who's going to save the cat. Val loses and concedes with a gentlemanly elbow as he says goodbye, Earl, because he's the only one that's allowed to have a threesome with these wild things. Unfortunately, the tractor flips out, and the graboid turns its attention to Val with a cool dirt shot. Keep that running, they keep running. by filming straight up and dropping dirt through a tube over the camera. The Graboid bursts from the ground, causing Val to stop and get a little footloose with it. The townsfolk use grade school level swears in an attempt to draw the creature away. Come on, you ugly son of a bitch! <laughs> Ronald Lebec gives a little lick kick, causing water vibrations to bring the Graboid over for a pool party, baby! Na 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 na! Val gets to the bulldozer, and since the Graboids can't hold on to the 30-ton beastie, he picks up everyone and heads to the jeep trail. Bert leads the charge like a gun-toting mermaid on a pirate ship. The Graboids are keeping their distance which is just fine with Val. I don't care what they're doing. As long as they're doing it way over there. Let's keep the camera way over there so we don't see writer Steve Wilson cameo as Bert Gummer. Oh, come on. Don't you see me? I'm right there. I can't see you, but I can see what the Graboids have been planning as the Whee! cat and all its little kitties fall into a hole. They dug a trap. Yes, Val. Very good. Here's your prize. Bert lights a pipe bomb and the resulting explosion forces the Graboids to flee. Val spots some rocky salvation, but it's a long ways away. So, guess it's time to sit down and make another pla- What if we ruin that way? Where does the we want to go? Then when it explodes, I mean, if it drives away, we run like goddamn bastards. Thank you, Rhonda. They toss the bomb and run for another set of paper mache holders. They make it to the rocks, but uh, what now? Oh, I know, more planning. Earl's latest idea is to go graboid fishing. They bait one of the graboids with rocks and tie a pipe bomb to a rope. Earl channels his inner Wonder Woman and tosses the line. He reels in a graboid that takes the bait and... Oh. Add another GB to the hunting log. Covered go. in great big globs of I love that rabbit. scene. It's like, it's like, I don't know what they use, like pumpkin or something. They did. It was yeah. a, the, he'll probably tell us here in just a second, but I just love the kid. He's, they're, they're all like, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Add another GB to the hunting uh, log. Covered in great big globs of greasy, grimy graboid guts. Which were actually made of cotton batting stuffed inside pantyhose, covered in slime, and for good measure, pumpkin pie filling for an extra little squishy splatty. With a killer clown balloon dog for garnish. The only graboid left is their old pal Stumpy. Time to bait, cast, and kaboom. Kaboom. I said. Well, shit. It lands on top of Bert's other bombs and. Damn. There's my kaboom. The resulting explosion scatters the everyone. See, like you said, the, the, the killer out. learned. Exactly. Basically, like, well, again, they're doing smart things, but it learned. It saw what happened to its friend and was like, well, I ain't eating one of those. Yeah, it's like, well, I'm going to send out a feeler for this one and not eat it directly. Yeah, and again, Stumpy is the is the main adversary graboid of our protagonist. Mm. And, you know, he's lost a snake tendril. He's figured out how to knock down the general store and almost take them out that way. And he's been chasing them this whole time. He's basically the alpha. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, learning. That's, I love it, man. Earl and Rhonda are intercepted by Stumpy, who screams so hard he needs a nap. Or maybe that was just Tom Woodruff Jr. being exhausted since he actually puppeteered the full-size creature from underground with only a flashlight and an oxygen tank to keep him company while buried alive. The rockers Jesus. try to distract Stumpy with noise. Stumpy responds by impersonating his favorite Homer Simpson gif, but Val's not buying it. This one ain't dumb. Hello, Pot. This is the kettle. Val finally takes some initiative and takes off on some very wobbly ground as the Graboid bursts through some styrofoam. Jesus, Val, what are you doing? I got a goddamn plan! But we didn't have a big, long discussion scene. That's not how plans work! 
The Graboid gives chase, and Rhonda joins since she has the lighter. When they reach the cliff's edge, Val shortens the fuse, holds, then lights it and tosses it behind the fast approaching wiggle worm. Earl thinks he's missed, but the resulting explosion causes Stumpy to pick up speed. The Graboid rushes towards Val at ludicrous speed, where he holds, until jumping away at the very last second, causing our worm to launch out the edge of the cliff and Bye. into the air. Do you fly, you sucker! Not till the third one! The Graboid is killed when it slams into the rocks in a practical effect that took numerous takes. Oh man, I want purple stuff. Also that's awesome though. Our three... Like, I, I love that effect as well. Yeah, like, that's the... probably my favorite one in the movie, actually, besides the exploding one. Yeah. Heroes watch over the side and wonder where Val got this idea. It just suddenly hit me, you know. Stampede. Calling back to the opening of the movie that <laughs> even shows Earl dressed like a Graboid falling out of the back of the truck. <laughs> That's a good foreshadow right there. Yeah. I like that. Fuck. Now that is how you write a goddamn script, friends. Time to wrap things up. Val and Earl are headed to Bixby. Bixby! Yeah, In hopes of getting into People magazine. People. Hell. National Geographic. Even better! That's the one that sometimes has boobs in it. Val and Rhonda awkwardly say goodbye, and that's where the movie originally ended. But thanks to a test screening audience and their chance of kiss her, kiss her, <laughs> they reshot an ending where he does just that. Yeah. Roll credits, Reva! <laughs> How many residents of perfection became Graboid Confections? Let's find out and get to the numbers. <laughs> you know, one's I like that. Man, that was I've good. been watching all these Tremors movies. They're a real fun time, so I might want to take over the kill counts after all. <laughs> Oh, James. What? Ah! Damn! You talking to the wrong <laughs> goddamn kill count, didn't you, you bastard? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love killing James. Damn. Ten people died in Tremors, seven men, one woman, and two unknown Nev Caltel workers, giving us a mostly blue pie chart that Bert definitely won't be voting for. With a runtime of 96 <laughs> minutes. Oh, well, actually, it was the eight. Yeah, that's the weird thing I found out. Before, uh, like, before the 90s, uh, turns out that a lot of news organizations had Republicans as blue and Democrats as red. But then the 90s rolled around and it swapped. Republicans became red and Democrats became blue. It's weird. Because it's, you look at, like, the news reports back in the 80s when Reagan won, and the news reports had, like, Reagan's, the states that Reagan won in blue, and then the ones that his uh, opponents won red. But then the 90s rolled around, and then Clinton was blue, and, and everyone else was red. It's, we it's weird, man. It's one of the... I, I don't understand. I don't understand Sounding why... It's a better political changes. system than red versus blue, anyways. I know. It should be, like, a bunch of different ones. But, yeah. oh well. It needs to be a big-ass colorful pie chart. It should be. Much like, uh, uh, I would take a pie chart that's, uh, that, you know, has these colors. I mean, why not? But, again. It gives us a kill on average every 9.6 minutes. And for our special Burt's hunting log, we can add four Graboids, giving us a Graboid kill on average every 24 minutes. We'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Walter Chang. It's the most on-screen death, and it's amazing to see someone actually in the mouth of one of these mother humpers. Bill Machete for lamest kill goes to the two Nev Calcell workers that came to check on the landslide. We don't ever get to see them aside from some lightly bloodied helmets. And our new Burt's hunting trophy goes to Stumpy. It's a very clever death instigated by a very unclever man. And I just love the scream here as the Grab Graboid realizes its mortality. And that's it. Tremors came out in 1990 and was a box office flop, but found new life in the home video market and spawned six sequels. I'll look at the first of those in two weeks. But until then, I'm a man <laughs> that Wilford Brimley once called the fuck in a red flannel shirt. And this has been the kill count. For the next kill count. <laughs> Puberty! It's a scary time for any creature, from man to ape to pre-Cambrian worm monster. It's a time of biological changes, such as mood swings, development of sexual attraction, morning sickness, hosts that still aren't James, and internal combustion. Something came out of it. But don't worry, once you pass this smelly life hurdle, you'll come out the other side a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> Or whatever the fuck that is! Tremors <laughs> 2 Aftershocks is an illustration of adolescence. Cool. It's a sequel that truly holds its own against the original. You know, it uh, gives you quite an edge. In fact, it's got even more of what you love from the first film. Giant worms, geologist love interests, and plans. Lots of plans! Like that, huh? So join returning cast members Fred Ward, Michael Gross, and not Kevin Bacon. Oh, actually, I'm not the, uh... 
original guy. And watch Tremors 2 Aftershock. Then on Friday, January 28th, set your seismos to fun for the kill counts. Only on Dead Meat. I feel I was denied. Critical. Need to know. Information. Tremors 2 Aftershock. <laughs> yes. Oh, so good. So, yeah. That was, a. Uh... Actually, hold on. Is there, uh... Oh, it's... Uh, it's Arks can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Tell them you did a great job. Thank you, James. Thank you. <laughs> oh, hi. Thank you so much for watching Even the very a first shot kill count that I or anyone else has ever done other than this man. And thank you, James, for trusting me to take over this hollowed set. You did great. Oh, thanks. And today is the release of the new Scream. And Zorn is actually the one who edited that awesome Scream House tour video that came out last week. If you didn't watch it, make sure you do. And then go see the new Scream uh, as safely as possible. Yes, very safely. Yeah, so I just want to be here for your first episode, man. Make sure it all went well. And it did, so I'll just leave you to the rest of them. Cool. So I'm going to be using this time to check in with James. So stay to the end card each week to find out what James is doing with his new wife, Chelsea. Oh, I'm so excited for you. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> oh. And you want to say the thing? I can, I can say the thing. You can say the thing. Oh, yes. Spay and neuter your pets. No, wrong thing. Oh. Bob Barker. The good people. <laughs> Trying to be Bob Barker there, Zorin? Jesus. So, yeah. Uh, damn, dude. Damn, I keep... It's been a while since I've seen Tremors, and it's still, like, in my... Like, the, memorabil the memorability of this film is just... Oh, so good. I can't believe it. I think it probably box office busted actually because of the name. I Maybe? think they screwed up on the name. Because, I mean, I like the name in retrospect, but if I was actually a moviegoer in 1990 and not just one year old, and I saw the name Tremors on a poster, I wouldn't think twice about it, you know? I'd be like, oh, like an earthquake movie? Who cares? Well, now, if that I was saw, the poster If I right saw there. the poster like that, I would just be like, that looks sick. I gotta go see that. But it's like, if I just heard somebody be like, have you seen Tremors? I'd be like, no, don't really. So, know what that is. let's see. In terms of reception, it's got an 86. 86 critical reset. Wow, they actually got it right. And uh, let's see. The crazy thing with the second one is it took six years to make the second one. And, I mean, according to, uh, like, reception on it, it's actually, in a lot of ways, a lot of, it's actually still pretty good all things considered also uh let's see uh yeah <laughs> still got the mustache that's mm -hmm. that's always some so uh let's see what was the uh go back to the original there we go so i'm just looking I also at like the fact that they came up with the idea in the second one of actually having them have a new form like, That's, instead of just like keeping yeah. the same thing, like they're like, how can we evolve it slightly? Like a lot of movies don't think about stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's like Aliens kind of did the same thing. Like I, th I wonder if they might have been like it was Aliens out by ninety. It's it still was. Oh yeah, it was eighty six. Right? Yeah, Aliens. Was I was 86. wondering if they might have been slightly inspired by that because even though they still have the Xenomorphs, they had the Xenomorph Queen in Aliens. Yeah. So it's like, well, let's just, you know, let's go bigger with it. Like, they were like, well, let's go not bigger with it, but let's go... Different. Different. Like, because they actually went smaller, but scarier in a way. Well, because now they're above ground. Yeah, and they can they follow you in the buildings lot and shit, you know? They multiply a lot easier, too, because of yeah. the, uh, their, uh, you know, all they have to do is eat, and then they regurgitate, like, an, an egg. Jurassic Park was 80s, right? Uh, no, that was 93. 93, okay. It was in my mind. I was going to say, they almost, like, pre-predicted, like, Jurassic Park with that idea. Well, technically, this came out after 93, the second one. Uh, yeah, um, the second one in 96. So, maybe they did were slightly inspired by Jurassic Park, because they were like, oh, it's cool to have the T-Rex, but the raptors were scary, too, you know? So oh, yeah. So, maybe we should do, like, smaller ones that are able to follow you indoors that are even scarier. <laughs> and look at all the, uh, look at all the stuff they got here. Yeah, I also uh, wondered after seeing this movie as a kid and then playing Silent Hill 3, I was like, I wonder if the 
creators of Silent Hill 3 watched um, Tremors and that inspired the worm fight in Silent Hill 3. Because it reminds me a lot of the rec room scene. Because it like, you know, his head comes out of the walls and stuff kind of in the same manner. Hold on, hold on. Let's see. Tremors. Uh, rec room. There it is. Broke into the wrong god dang rec room, didn't you, you <laughs> bastard? Yeah. So I, I just need to see the... Yeah, here it is. Uh, just want to watch it one more time. I just want to watch the... I just want to, like... Again, pure visual storytelling. Fox, boom. There's all these other shells, and then yeah. you see that <laughs> son of a bitch. Yep. It's like, that's a 12-gauge shotgun shell. Look at that motherfucker. Literally twice the size of one, pretty much. <laughs> twice the, Yeah, and that's a solid slug. Jesus H. I love it. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, the flare gun. And then, boom, baby. I also like how she plugs her ears when he fires it. Yeah. Well, of course, because it's a fucking elephant gun. <laughs> Nitro Express, have you ever, like, if you think a regular gun's loud, like, imagine, like, a 2,000 powder count friggin' Nitro Express going off next to your fucking head. <laughs> you'd go deaf in one ear, probably. Well, at least temporarily. I mean, you'd pr it'd probably be like, be like, I'm firing the elephant gun. What? Whee! <laughs> And all of a sudden, it's just like, mop, 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 mop. 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 It's like, it's like, honey, did you cover your ears? What? <laughs> uh, sorry. But anyway, so, um, yeah, again, just so many good memories from Tremors. Watching it with my dad, watching it, uh, like, just watching it with my family. Oh, God. Huh. Yeah, anyway, I think that's going to do it, everyone. That was uh, Dead Meat Trimmers, hosted by Zoran, and he did a good job. I got to admit, he actually did a much better job than I thought he would. And uh, very impressed with that. And I guess uh, for now, that's going to do it. So until next time, everyone, signing off, I'm Nate. I am Nick. We'll see you later, everybody. Peace. <laughs>